Good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Stoat. I'm the Media and Program Specialist at the Framingham Library. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here in, pro, uh, in person and the folks who are watching from home. Uh, we're so thrilled you, you're able to join us tonight. Uh, if you know someone who couldn't be here, uh, this is being uh, filmed and uh, will be posted on our library's YouTube page. We're so excited to feature and welcome back once again, Dr. David Smales, Associate Professor of Political Science at Framingham State University for this lecture this evening. Uh, he'll be talking about what did the midterms tell us. And tonight's lecture is a part of our lifelong learning lecture series, a partnership with Framingham State University, and we are so grateful for that partnership. A few announcements before I turn the program over to Dr. Smales. I'd just like to ask you to silence your cell phones. And we'd like to thank our uh, sponsors, the Joseph L. and Ray L. Freund Foundation, courtesy of Elizabeth Fideller. And thank you to the Friends of the Framingham Library. Uh, they really helped to make all, all of these programs possible. If you'd like to donate to the Friends, there is a box in the back. Um, we have evaluation forms at the back for after the program, and we'd love to hear from you about uh, what you thought of tonight's event, as well as ideas you have for the future. Um, I would like to say that Dr. Smales is going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll take about 15 minutes of questions. If you could please hold them to the end, we'd appreciate that. Um, and, and that is for people here um, in person in the room. Uh, please join us for our next lecture in this series. It's next week, uh, Thursday, November 17th. We'll be featuring artist and print printmaker Coco Berkman, who will be discussing the agony and bliss of the creative process. Finally, for more information about our other great programs, please check out our flyers in the back. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. David Smales. Thank you, Nancy, so much. And thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us uh, online as well. Um, I appreciate uh, the invitation. I always enjoy doing these programs. In fact, uh, I did a very similar program after the 2020 election. And I remember when the notice was posted on Facebook, someone made a comment that you know the lecture was being done two days after the election, which, of course, stretched into a much longer period of time. And the fellow said, why are you bothering? We don't know anything yet. Well, I guess that was kind of true, and maybe a little bit true about the midterms. We're still waiting, of course, to find out a few of the races, how they're going to be decided. And of course, those are going to be important decisions, as we'll talk about tonight um, as well. So as, as, um, as the saying goes, it ain't over till it's over, and it ain't over yet um, as far as this election. But I think we can say a few things about it, and I th certainly think we can say some things about what it means and where, it's, where we're heading because of it. And that's really what this tonight is really all about. Um, you know, if there's one truism about midterm elections that is generally shared, and I'm sure you've heard this this week and maybe even the weeks leading up to this election, it's that the president's party always loses at midterms. We tend as voters to vote what's known as retrospectively. We think back over the last two years often when we make decisions about elections. It's a very common thing. You might remember Ronald Reagan in 1980 in his closing remarks in the debate with Jimmy Carter said, are you better off than you were four years ago? And the idea, of course, was that was meant to get people to think back over the Carter years and whether or not they were happy. Very common sort of theme um, that, that most people strike when they talk about midterm elections. But this year has been different um, in that way. In fact, quite historic. Um, if you look back to 1934, all the way up to the last midterm election, the average loss for the president's party in midterm elections was 22 House seats and four Senate seats. So it gives you an idea that that truism is in fact true when you look at the historical record. And when you look at the president's approval rating when a midterm election takes place, any president who has approval rating between 
40 and 45 percent, which is roughly where Joe Biden is these days. Some polls give him 30, 43, some 44, but he's in that range. The Senate loss in those kind of uh, elections stretches from nine seats lost for the president's uh, party to the possibility of picking up maybe one or two if the president's fortunate. But the average is minus four. Four seats on average are lost when the president's approval rating is in the low 40s. And in the House, it's even worse. <laughs> the range goes from 63 seats lost uh, to 13 seats lost. So it seems almost inevitable that a president who has an approval rating in the low 40s is probably going to lose seats in the House and more than likely lose seats in the Senate. At least that's been the pattern. And in fact, just to throw some numbers at you, and we won't spend much time looking at numbers tonight, I promise, but just to show you some of these, this is the record, at least from John Kennedy on, of midterm results for presidents. And if you notice, if you look down that column labeled the House column, it's certainly true that um, in almost every midterm election, there's been a loss of seats in the House of Representatives. Um, in the Senate, again, perhaps more of a mixed result, but still the, the, the general trend is that a few Senate seats are lost every time. There are a couple exceptions to that rule, of course. The biggest exception was 2002, when George W. Bush had his first midterm election in his presidency. His party actually gained eight seats in the House of Representatives and two seats in the Senate. But of course, you remember that was right after 9-11, right? That was the year after 9-11. Bush's approval ratings were still up in the 80s. And as a result, of course, that carried over into the midterm results. But you can go back to, for example, Bill Clinton's midterm election, his first one in 1994. You might remember that was the year of the new Gingrich and the Republicans took over the, the House of Representatives, a big loss in that year to the president's party of 54 seats. And of course, more recently, Barack Obama's first midterm election um, that took place in, in 2013, oh, excuse me, no, 2010, sorry, um, where he lost 63 seats, by far the, the worst loss of seats for the president's party in a midterm election. He got on television the next day, you might remember it said, we got shellacked. That was the term that he used for that in that, in that particular midterm. So everyone's expectation was really based on these numbers. Um, the historical pattern was always that the president's party was likely to lose seats in the House and more than likely to lose seats in the Senate. By the way, I labeled um, some of these new because I just wanted to show you wh where the midterm election actually threw the House or Senate into the other party's hands. So again, if you look at 1994, the Republicans took over the House. That's why it says R new and they took over the Senate um, because of that midterm election. So midterms have had consequences of changing the political party. That's also been the case, but not in every midterm election. Um, the president's party might lose a few seats, but survive as far as keeping control of the House and Senate through all that. So why is this one different, right? Why didn't that happen this time? Because as far as we can tell, and we'll look at some results in a minute, it doesn't seem very likely that we're going to have that kind of deep loss for the president's party in these midterm elections. Well, I think one reason is certainly the abortion issue. That played a role here. It played a role in motivating some voters to turn out, motivated some of them to vote Democratic, who perhaps were undecided um, uh, in going into um, 2022. We just don't know, though, what kind of a role or how much of a role it played. We're still going to have to wait for some poll numbers, I think, to be done to really know for sure how much that particular issue impacted things. The thing we do know, though, is that the Democrats tended to win a lot of independent voters this time around, more than any other election. Usually the independent voters go to the opposite party of the president. This time they split more or less 50-50 between the Republicans and Democrats, and that helped in some of these close races. That was the, the, the push, you might say, that helped a lot in trying to change things. The other thing is <laughs> lots and lots and lots and lots of money this time around. By far the most spending that's ever been done on a midterm election, almost twice as much as the last midterm election um, in this one. $3.7 billion spent by the Democrats, $3.4 billion for the Republicans. If you add in the spending of independent candidates and the governor's races, it comes out to a whopping $9 billion. Um, this time around. So there was a lot of money being invested 
in these campaigns. And if you watch local television, of course, you were inundated with Maggie Hassan ads and uh, Boldick ads, right? We just couldn't seem, couldn't, we couldn't escape a lot of the political ads that we were seeing. And the other thing that really changed this time is lots and lots of turnout. That's the other side of this. In fact, if you look at turnouts in midterm elections, um, midterm elections usually drew about 40% of the voting, uh, the eligible voting population. Um, the last one, the one in 2018, um, Donald Trump's midterm election, um, drew about 50% um, of the public, 50, close to 51%. And we're easily in that range for this uh, midterm election. We don't know the final totals yet, but in most of the states, the, the, the turnout for the vote in individual states was higher than 2020. Um, we're at least going to think make 50% um, this time around. It may even be higher. And with that, we're approaching presidential election levels when it comes to turnout, when you start talking about mid-50s or even low 60s. So there were a lot of people voting this time, um, a lot of more people than usual voting in, in, in these elections. And when you break down the vote, a lot of those voters were young voters who were, uh, who were voting. Roughly a quarter of all young people voted in this election, and by young, I mean my college age students. Um, very unusual for students to be that motivated to participate in a midterm election. Presidential, you can usually get them to, to, to be interested, but midterms, it's a little harder. Um, but this time around, they were really motivated to turn out the vote. The other thing, of course, are exit polls, and I'm always a little leery of exit polls because they don't, they're not always that accurate but at least it gives a snapshot of what some people were thinking on election day. And there were a few things I think that were really interesting in the, in the uh, uh, exit polls this time around. One thing is um, both sides think the other party is really a terrible party. <laughs> the deep divide that we feel really came through in the exit polls. Um, we're talking about roughly in the, the high 80s, even 90% or higher had an unfavorable opinion of the opposition party. So if you're a Democrat, you really look down on the Republicans. If you're a Republican, you really look down on the Democrats in huge numbers. Um, that divide was also reflected in the question that a couple different polls asked, do you think the opposition party, the other party, is extreme? And with that, again, roughly 80% of the people who responded to that question, um, even a little higher, said they thought the Republican Party is too extreme or the Democratic Party is too extreme. So we not only have this great divide, so to speak, between the two political parties, but we also think the other party is too extreme in its politics. 13% said they thought both of them were extreme, which I kind of thought, you know, I can sort of understand that maybe. Some people are just sort of saying, eh, you know, a pox on both your houses when it comes to how extreme you are. But that was certainly a, a, a concern. The other thing that I thought was interesting, though, was that, you know, two thirds of the people in these polls actually thought that democracy was threatened during this time. So if there's one thing that we collectively can agree on, it seems, at least to a great extent, is our concern for the future about all of this. And I, I think one of the things that has happened in the 2022 election, if I can just editorialize for a second, is that I was relieved, as I'm sure many of you were, to find that there wasn't a lot of um, violence during the election. There wasn't a lot of challenges of, to you know, the honesty and integrity of the election. We came through this election pretty well, I thought. And knowing that, you know, that can always change, but knowing that that wasn't sort of the immediate response when people's candidates lost in the election, I was a bit relieved with that. And I think maybe that's a little light at the end of the tunnel as far as that issue goes. So where are we now? And I've just updated these numbers about an hour ago, so hopefully they haven't changed <laughs> since then. But 48 Democrats have been elected to the Senate, 49 Republicans have been elected to the Senate. So it's a very close divide. And I'll just remind you that if the Democrats get 50 votes, the Vice President, Vice President Harris, breaks that tie and gives the Democrats a majority. Um, right now, Arizona, leaning, I think, towards the Democrats. It seems as though um, the, the, uh, Mark Kelly is going to end up winning Arizona. There's still a chunk of votes to, to, to be decided, but he, it's certainly leading in that direction. I think Nevada is probably going to end up going Republican. I think Laxalt is probably going to pull off um, winning Ar Arizona, so, or excuse me, Nevada. So that will add one to each of these sides. It'll be 49 Democrats and 50 Republicans if it turns out that way. 
So everything is coming down to Georgia. <laughs> everything is coming down to this contest between Warnock and, and Walker in Georgia. And of course, Georgia's laws, I'm sure you've heard, um, requires that a candidate get 50% of the vote in order to win an election. That's true actually in all the votes in, 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 in Georgia. Warnock, 49.7%, I think, is the number that I still saw today, with 99% of the votes cast and counted. Um, it's not likely that that number is going to change. So we're certainly heading for a runoff election in Georgia. The Georgia Secretary of State, in fact, announced that even before um, the rest of the results were tab tabulated that night. Um, so we're going to have to wait until December 6th, that's the date of the runoff election in Georgia, to determine who really is going to be in control of the Senate. Um, the only other way that could possibly happen if, is Arizona ends up going Republican, which again, I, I very seriously doubt is going to happen. So as much as we'd like to have this over, it's not going to be over as far as the Senate is concerned until December 6th. Um, you know, as, as Mick Jagger said, you can't always get what you want, right? And we, we would love to have this settled now, but I think we're gonna have to wait a few weeks. And of course, we're gonna be watching a lot of money and a lot of effort pour into Georgia over the next few weeks as well. Um, everything is back to zero as far as the vote count goes, right? It's as if it's a new election with a runoff election. So more, more to come certainly over the next few weeks. House of Representatives, a little different story there. Um, so far, 192 Democrats have won seats in the House of Representatives. 209 Republicans have won seats in the House of Representatives. Now, you need 218 for a majority in the House of Representatives. So neither party is there yet. But when you look at what remains as far as the House races go, it's pretty clearly tilting towards the Republicans as far as winning the House of Representatives. Again, it's not a done deal, but it certainly appears that that's where things are heading. Um, 12 Democratic seats flipped to Republicans this time around. They were held by Democrats. Now they're going to be held by Republicans. Six seats that were held by Republicans have flipped to the Democrats. So the Republicans picked up six seats in, on balance. Um, in this election. They've gained some ground as far as that goes. And in addition to that, the remaining seats that are to be determined, at least 12 of them seem to be leaning pretty strongly towards the Republicans. Now, if you add those 12 votes into 209, you get 221, and that is enough to give the Republicans a majority. So as I say, again, presuming that there's not going to be any great surprises, in these remaining races. Um, most of them are in California in very conservative districts. There's two in Arizona, that's a very, both of which are very conservative districts. It's not likely that uh, those 12 seats are gonna be won by the Democrats. I think the Republicans probably have them pretty wrapped up. And that means then that there will be a majority, but a very narrow majority. That's only three votes, really, that you can lose and still hang on to a majority. So. If the Republicans win, they're not going to be in much different shape than the Democrats are right now in the House of Representatives. They actually have a little bit more of a cushion of a few votes. It's going to be a very, very narrow majority for the, for the Republicans coming out of this. As far as the governors are concerned, actually, you know, the one, I guess, good piece of news for both parties is things didn't change much as far as the governors go. Um, going into this, 14 states remained in the hands of Democrats, 16 states remained in the hands of Republicans in the governor's races around the country. Um, two flipped to the Democrats, none flipped to the Republicans, so the Democrats actually picked up two um, governor's positions, and including one of them, of course, being Massachusetts, right? Maura Healy's victory is, is, uh, is one of those. Um, but we're still waiting, again, on a couple states, um, Oregon and Arizona, both seem to be leaning towards the Democrats winning. Um, Nevada and Alaska certainly are, seem to be leaning towards the Republicans winning. Um, we're gonna have to wait and see whether those numbers hold. Um, in a few of those states, or I mean, Arizona in particular and Nevada, we're still talking about a pretty big chunk of votes that haven't been counted yet. Roughly you know, 80% have been counted, but that's still a lot that are outstanding. So we don't really know for sure if things are gonna end up that way, but at least it looks like that's, that's where things are going. So it's a real mixed story in, in a way, um, depending on what happens with the Senate and assuming that things do turn out the way that seems to be predicted for the Senate, it does look as though the Democrats have a very good chance of hanging on to the Senate, almost certain that they're going to lose control of the House. That's what it really comes down to. 
um, when you're looking at the balance in, in Congress. So what does that mean? <laughs> What's it gonna mean for us if the Republicans win the House of Representatives? Well, that's, I think, an interesting story that tells us a lot about what our politics are gonna be like for the next two years. I mean, one thing I think we can be pretty certain, if not absolutely certain about, is Kevin McCarthy. He has announced even a month ago that he plans to run for Speaker of the House of Representatives. Now, he has to be elected by a majority of the members of the House, which means all the Republicans virtually will have to line up behind him in order to guarantee his speakership. 221 votes, he can lose one or two if people are disgruntled with him in the Republican Party, but he has to hang on to the rest of them to become Speaker of the House. Um, as I said, he announced about a month ago, so it's, he's been clearly the front runner, you might say, in this, in this um, contest to become Speaker of the House. No one has stepped forward yet to challenge him. It's very interesting. There's a lot of grumbling about Kevin McCarthy. Um, a lot of the uh, Freedom Caucus members, that group of very conservative um, Republicans who were determined to cut the size of government um, earlier in, in, in the, early in the uh, uh, Obama administration and a little bit later in the Trump years, those folks are still roughly about 40 of them in the House of Representatives, very unhappy with a leader that doesn't sort of take on the Democrats and act very tough with the Democrats. So whether or not one of them might emerge as a challenger to Kevin McCarthy, we're going to have to wait and see if that happens. The one name I've heard batted around a little bit in the stuff that I've read is Jim Jordan from Ohio. He's a member of that group. He's been very conservative. Um, they want to hold Kevin McCarthy's feet to the fire. And whether or not Jordan will step up and challenge him, again, we'll have to wait and see. You know that old adage about if you're going to shoot at the king, you better make sure that you hit him? Uh, it's a little bit like that with the Speaker of the House. If you're going to challenge the Speaker, you better make sure you're going to win because almost guaranteed when that person does become Speaker, you're not going to get any favors from them for the next two years. So that might discourage people from challenging Kevin McCarthy. Um, when Nancy Pelosi took back over as Speaker in 2018, there were about 30 or 40 Democratic candidates who had actually pledged not to vote for Nancy Pelosi as Speaker if they got elected. Um, Democrat after Democrat who was running for the first time for the House. But when they got to the House of Representatives, no one was willing to be their candidate. <laughs> there was absolutely no one wanted to step forward and say, OK, I'll be the person to take on Nancy Pelosi. So she never did have a challenger for that reason. Same thing might happen with Kevin McCarthy. We'll have to wait and see. Very divided Republican caucus, though. The caucus meaning, of course, all the members of the Republican Party meeting together. Um, it's a very divided caucus. Again, the Freedom Caucus, the group within this group that is very conservative, are really already making demands if Kevin McCarthy wants their support. And one of the big demands that they're making, and this is something I think to watch out for, in the news, you're going to hear about it, has to do with something called a motion to vacate the chair. What a motion to vacate the chair means in Congress is that you're asking for basically a vote of confidence in the Speaker of the House. You want to take a vote to see if the Speaker still has a majority of members who believe in their leadership. It's been tried in the past. They tried it with John Boehner when he was Speaker. The people who led that movement and actually made that motion ended up losing their committee assignments because of it. Again, if you're going to do this, you better make sure you're going to win. But one of the big changes that's coming, or once the, the Freedom Caucus wants to have come, is that anybody they think should be able to make one of these challenges. Anyone should be able to call for this vote. Right now, the way the rules in the House of Representatives are written, only the minority leader can make this motion which means the leader of the Democrats, whoever that might end up being in the House of Representatives, when they're in the, if and when they're in the minority, that's the person, the only person who can actually call for this vote. And of course, they do that if they think the majority is unlikely to, to, to back the speaker. Now the Freedom Caucus says any one of us should be able to do this. Any one of us should at any time be able to call Kevin McCarthy to the carpet and demand a vote to see whether or not he still has our support. That means Kevin McCarthy has to go to bed every night worried about whether he's going to have his job in the morning as speaker. That's what it really amounts to. And if he wants to keep that job, he's going to have to keep all these people together. And that means they've got a lot of power over him when it comes to what they want to get done. 
So already members of the House of Representatives on the Republican side are making demands. If you want my support, this is what you need to do for me. Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example, who lost all of her committee assignments a couple of years ago. Um, you might remember she was stripped of her committee assignments for some of the things that she said on the floor of the House of Representatives. She's already said to Kevin McCarthy, if you want my vote, you've got to put me back on committees. And not only that, but here's a list of the committees that I'm, are acceptable to me, whether or not you can put me on them. So already this pressure is on. And as I say, if they make this rule change, it's going to be easy for people to do that throughout the time that Kevin McCarthy is speaker. Um, the other thing that I think is a big change is, is what I call the John Boehner alternative or, or, or solution. When John Boehner faced this problem, too, big group of Freedom Caucus members who didn't support him, the way he got things done as a Republican speaker was he made deals with the Democrats. He got as many Republican votes together as he could, and then he struck bargains with the Democrats to get the rest of the votes he needed to get things done. That's not going to be possible for Kevin McCarthy to do. I think the minute the word gets out that he's meeting with the Democrats in any sort of way, there's going to be one of these motions to vacate the chair. They're not going to tolerate Kevin McCarthy making deals behind the scenes. And you might remember this is actually what happened to Newt Gingrich. Um, when Newt Gingrich was speaker in 1995, when we had the government shutdown in October, Newt sort of held his ground for about two months, but finally struck a deal with the Clinton folks and Bob Dole, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate. And just a few months later, there was a vote to uh, kick Newt Gingrich out as speaker. So there's not going to be any compromise this time around with the House of Representatives. There are not going to be any deals being struck, which, of course, is going to make it very difficult to get things done as far as the, the House is concerned. McCarthy's already sort of announced his agenda. He's already said in, an, in a couple interviews that he's going to introduce legislation to strengthen border security. That's going to be the first action he takes as speaker. He's talked about oversight and investigation into some aspects of the Biden administration. He specifically talked about the, the withdrawal in Afghanistan, um, looking into how th that happened and why it was sort of, um, you know, kind of fell apart um, as it happened. He's talking about trying to investigate the origins of COVID, which kind of seems like an odd one at first. But when you think about the fact that that would probably lead us to being very critical of China, it kind of fits with the Republican position right now that we should be tougher on China and so on. So I think that's kind of a, a stalking horse for that issue. And then investigations into the federal government's use of its power to investigate what has been labeled domestic terrorism by Merrick Garland, the, the attorney general, some of the violence and threats that have come about at school board meetings. Um, where you know, parents have come in and they've, they've actually threatened people directly and the great concern about you know, that violence getting worse and worse. So he wants an investigation into the FBI's use of its power in doing that. Um, all things that, you know, again, sort of reasonable and certainly things that the Republicans have been kicking around over the last two years, whether we agree with them or not, this, this really has been the Republican agenda. What isn't on that list and what he didn't mention was the agenda for the MAGA supporters, the folks in the House, again, who are very critical of the Democrats, the Freedom Caucus crowd, um, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, right, the Matt Gaetzes, and so on, who do not want to see any kind of compromise. And when they're asked what their agenda is, almost to a person, they say the same thing. Lots and lots of investigations. Now, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, we're going to have to see how the politics of it plays out. But that certainly seems to be the direction that this group wants to take the House of Representatives. And again, I'll just say, you know, when it comes right down to it, they've got the clout with Kevin McCarthy to make him follow their agenda and not his. And it will be kind of, I think, a struggle or a contest to see how far some of that's going to go and whether or not McCarthy can put some brakes on it in some way. But he's going to have a hard time doing that, especially, again, if they change this rule it's going to be very difficult for him to resist um, the, the demands of this group because he needs their votes. And they, he needs their votes to pass things, but he needs their votes to keep his job as well. So this is going to be a rough two years for Kevin McCarthy. As, as much as you know, he's been giving interviews and he's happy that, that they're winning the control of the House of Representatives, and of course that is for them a good thing, it's also going to be a very rocky road that <laughs> he's going to be on for the next two years. Um, he's not going to sleep well at night, as I say, knowing what's, what he's facing. How about over in the Senate? What if the Republicans win the Senate? Well, Mitch McConnell 
actually has been talking about his agenda as well. And it's interesting the way that he puts it, because he says when it comes to dealing with the Biden administration, he's looking forward to drawing contrast, but also some cooperation with the Biden administration and the Democrats. So some cooperation, I know it doesn't sound like much of a commitment, but the fact that door was even opened by McConnell, that he might be willing to make some deals with Democrats, talk to the Democrats, strike some compromises, of course, is the very thing that's going to upset the people over in the House of Representatives who don't want to do any of that. So will there be a bit of a struggle between the Republicans of the House and the Republicans in the Senate over what their agenda should be and how they should treat the Biden administration? I think, again, that's a question we're going to have to see unfold over the next two years. But the fact that McConnell is willing to say that and, and sort of make that commitment, I thought was a really interesting signal that he was willing to make some compromises that, that others clearly aren't. He's a lot more vague, though, about what specifically he wants to do. He's talked about inflation, dealing with inflation. He's talked about border security as well. He's talked about crime, but he hasn't really offered any specifics about what he wants to see happen on any of those issues. So we really don't know sort of where he's going to take the Senate if he does become majority leader. One thing we do know from the past is that he's likely to block a lot of appointments that Joe Biden wants to make either to replace members of his own administration or nomination of federal judges or even Supreme Court judges. And we may well go through that whole politics again of, of denying hearings to Supreme Court nominees if, if anyone does in fact leave the court. Um, a lot less likely, I think, now. The court's a much younger court, much healthier court, but it's, it's always possible. And if it does happen, I think we're going to be back to that struggle over who gets to name a Supreme Court justice, whether or not President Biden will have the opportunity even to have his nominee come up for discussion and a vote um, in the U.S. Senate. So I think on those issues, McConnell will still kind of hold the line that he's always held. But again, he's also subject to challenge. And there's a lot of rumblings in the Senate that McConnell may not be tough enough on the Democrats. And there are some members of the Senate who also share this view that you know, compromise is always the wrong path to take. And so whether or not someone will emerge to challenge him as the majority leader is another interesting question. Um, it hasn't happened so far for Mitch McConnell. It could happen this time. In fact, the one name that keeps popping up and to keep an eye out in the news is Rick Scott from Florida. He is a member of this much more conservative Freedom Caucus group in the Senate. Um, he's the person that many of the, that group are talking about as a potential replacement for Mitch McConnell. Now, again, whether or not Scott will take that step, we'll have to wait and see. But that's someone else to keep an eye on because I think in the end there is the likelihood that this group will want to challenge McConnell, especially if he keeps talking the way that he has about working with the Democrats and so on. So as far as 2024 goes, <laughs> what does all this mean, right? Well, you know, I hate to tell you this, but it, this, this election started already. Um, it started about three months ago, um, at least in a visible way. I'm sure invisibly it's been going on long before that. But we're now at a point where we're beginning to see some of what's shaping 2024. And of course, we got that yesterday from the president, right? Did you see President Biden's um, talk yesterday, his press conference? He talked about his own plans and said, and I'm quoting him directly here, and so in my judgment of running, when I announce, if I announce, now my intention is that I could run again, but it's a great respect, I'm a great respecter of fate, and so on. We call that first part, when I announce, or I mean, uh, if I announce, that's, that's what we call in politics a Freudian slip. Uh, I, think, I think it's clear that Biden has decided he's going to run. I just think it's a question of when he wants to announce that he's going to run. I'd be very surprised if he didn't at this point, um, the way that he's been talking. But again, we'll have to see if a Democrat chooses to challenge him for the nomination. It's a rare thing for the you know, sitting president to be challenged in a primary, but it has happened before and it could happen again. What about Donald Trump? Well, you know, again, Trump's been making a lot of moves, a lot of talk, of course, as he's been campaigning around the country. A lot of media folks have been talking about the possibility of Trump running again in 2024. I just offer this to you um, as almost a, two or three days after the FBI um, uh, did the search at Mar-a-Lago, um, President Trump's or former President Trump's um, organization released on um, the, the true social platform that he's been using for all his tweets these days, 
a video. It's about a four minute long video. And if you haven't seen it, I, I'd recommend you go and Google it and take a look at it. it it's clearly a campaign video. Um, it talks about the state the country's in, the difficulties the country's facing. It has Donald Trump appearing before crowds, talking about our best days are yet to come and so on. It plays like a video of a candidate running for office. And he's had that video going for months now um, that's out there, no doubt being passed around um, among some of, a lot of his former supporters. So he hasn't announced, but I think that video is clearly a beginning of a campaign. And of course, we should add to that maybe um, what's going to happen on Tuesday, right? I mean, he's, he has said he's going to make an announcement. We don't know what it will be. Um, you know, President, former President Trump, he likes surprises. He likes to catch people unawares. We just don't know what exactly he has in mind for Tuesday. He may well end up announcing he's going to run. Apparently, everyone around him is telling him not to do it, not to distract from Georgia, um, since that is going to be the focus of everyone's attention. No one really wants any kind of attention drawn away from that. But again, Mr. Trump doesn't always listen to the people around him. He likes to do what he wants to do. And there's a very good chance that he may follow through with it anyway. So we will have to wait until Tuesday to see um, what the nature of that announcement is going to be. But again, I think he's pretty clearly signaled that he's planning to run as far as that goes. There's still a few hopefuls out there, though, to, to unseat Donald Trump as the nominee of the party in 2024. Um, one that I know you're already thinking of probably, and that's Mr. DeSantis. We'll talk about him in a minute, but I want to show you two others that are making a lot of moves that you probably haven't noticed. Um, they've been covered, but not covered widely. One is Mike Pence. He has been out there working on building support for a presidential run in 2024. Um, he's doing a town hall meeting next week with CNN as a way of introducing himself, I think, or reintroducing himself, I should say, to the public. He's got a book coming out in connection with that town hall meeting um, that, uh, uh, so help me God, which is really sort of his account of his political career and his political views. It's very much a kind of campaign biography, apparently. So he will have that circulating around. He has spent a lot of time in New Hampshire. <laughs> He's been in New Hampshire quite a bit. Um, there's a traditional breakfast that's held called, uh, it's called Politics and Eggs at St. Anselm College, um, there is always a string of Republican hopefuls that go to that because most of the major Republican sort of political leaders in the state gather for those events. He's been there. Um, he's done GOP fundraisers up in New Hampshire um, over and over again. Um, he did campaign for, for Bolduc in this last election, but he only went to New Hampshire once to do that. I think maybe he was a little worried about um, distancing himself from, from Dan Bolduc when it looked like Bolduc's chances weren't so good. But he has certainly been a presence in, in New Hampshire. And there's no doubt if you're spending that much time in New Hampshire, you're not there to watch the leaves turn, right? You're there for politics. That's why you're there. The other place he's been to is Iowa. And it's, again, a, a almost a requirement if you're going to run for president to go to the Iowa State Fair to meet people there. They have a giant butter cow, believe it or not. This cow made out of butter. If you've never seen it, again, Google it. It's very interesting. But that, again, is an event that always seems to signal the people who are really seriously considering a run for the presidency. The Iowa caucus, of course, and the New Hampshire primary are the first two co contests in the, uh, in the nomination process and will be in, in 2024. So Pence has been making all the moves. He hasn't announced yet, of course. Um, when you announce that you're a candidate for the presidency, you then have to start reporting donations to the Federal Election Commission. So they often delay that formal announcement. But he's certainly making the moves to be a candidate. So is Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State. He's been very active behind the scenes and he's been very quiet about it. Um, again, not a lot of attention has been paid to him so far, but he certainly has been putting in the time. In fact, he was up in New Hampshire and when a reporter said, um, you know, oh, you're in New Hampshire. He said, believe it or not, um, I am here and it's not random. <laughs> and it was his way, I think, of saying to the reporters, look, you know why I'm here. You know why I'm spending time in New Hampshire. He also has done the, the Politics and Eggs event. He's done uh, Hill, uh, the Hillsborough County um, dinner, which, again, is a big fundraising dinner for, for Republican candidates in New Hampshire. Um, he's, again, meeting all the right people through these events if you're going to be a candidate in New Hampshire and try to get support from the Republican Party. He's actually spent even more time in Iowa than any of these candidates. 
Um, he's been there a lot. He's been to the fair. He's been there for fundraisers. He did four big fundraisers last spring for, um, for Iowa, for the Republican Party in Iowa. He campaigned for their candidates. He was out there in October campaigning for their candidates uh, for the midterm election that we just had. He's been running digital ads targeted in Iowa as well as South Carolina, which is a third big primary state that comes up very early in the process. Um, again, he's been touching all the bases as far as that goes. And I don't think much attention has been paid to Mike Pompeo, but I certainly think he's very, a very likely candidate in all this. And then, of course, there's Ron DeSantis, right, who we have to talk about as well. And I'll, I'll finish with him and then open it up for questions. But let me warn you, I would not make any big assumptions about Ron DeSantis just yet. And I'll tell you why. I've got a couple reasons why I think it may be a little doubtful about what Ron DeSantis is up to. First of all, he has not been to New Hampshire. They've invited him four or five times, apparently, this summer. He turned them down every time. So he's not made that move. Now, that alone doesn't mean anything. Maybe he was more focused on his own campaign. Maybe he thinks it's too early to get up there and meet people. Maybe he figured he'd let the other candidates sort of work the, work the rooms and then he would go up. But it is a little significant, I think, that he's been turning down invitations. People up in New Hampshire have actually complained a bit about it. Um, the, some of the Republican leadership up in New Hampshire has said, you know, why isn't he willing to come up here and talk to us? The other thing is he hasn't been out to Iowa at all. He has also not touched that base. Um, and again, he's still got time. Don't mean to suggest that alone is, is, is reason enough. He actually, when you do polls in Iowa, he actually polls pretty well right now um, among Republican voters. When they're asked, who would you like to see as a candidate in 2024, his name rises to the top of the list. So he, maybe he doesn't need to be out in Iowa right now, um, but he hasn't been there yet. He hasn't made any of those moves yet. And in fact, he's not actually set any kind of date for making this decision. Um, a lot of speculation is sort of swirling around about why he's waiting to even make anything public that, that he's planning or even thinking about running. When he had his victory rally the other night in Florida um, and you listened to the room, and again, you can see this on, on, on YouTube, um, the people in the room started shouting two more years, two more years instead of four more. And the reason for that, of course, is 2024 is in two years. So two more years as governor and then president is sort of what they were cheering on. And he kind of laughed and shook his head and you know waved. But at least so far, there hasn't been any kind of substantive behind the scenes talk about when he might declare, if in fact he's going to declare. There has been some talk about he may wait until he's actually sworn in as governor before he makes that public move. That's possible. There's also the talk about whether or not he's going to wait until May or June of next year, because that's when his legislature is in session in Florida. And he might well use that opportunity to advance a lot of issues that would be appealing to Republican voters in primaries, the so called red meat issues, as they call them in politics, the kind of issues that get people excited about a candidate. So maybe his strategy is to just hold off a little bit and then make his move a bit later in that way. It's also possible that he may start lining up donors at the beginning of this year after he becomes governor. He's maybe he's waiting to see if the money is there. And of course, there have been some pretty you know, clear public announcements by some major Republican donors that they don't plan to back Donald Trump if he runs for the nomination again. Um, I don't think he necessarily needs their money. He's got a lot of donors that will give to his campaign. But it's certainly the case that if you start to hear Ron DeSantis making some of those rounds, it's much more likely he's going to be a candidate. But I'll put this out, and I'm not going to make this a prediction. I, I gave this presentation in my elections class this morning, and when I said this, they all went, oh, Dr. Sveos, come on. But think about this for just a minute. Ron DeSantis is a young guy. He doesn't have to run right away. He could be waiting for 2028. He may simply decide to sit this one out, especially if he thinks that Donald Trump has a pretty good chance of being the nominee. He may well say to himself, let the party go through this fight around Donald Trump. I don't need to be in the middle of it. I'll pick up the pieces afterwards and run in 2028. He may make that decision. I don't know. Um, he may very well be heading for that. I think a lot of the presumption right now is that he's going to run, but that may not necessarily be the case. And, uh, you know, six months from now, you can come back and say to me, Dave, you were all wrong about that. But I think it's a, I think it's a distinct possibility. I think he may really be thinking long term instead of short term 
when it comes to his own presidential election. So we'll have to see. But we're in for two years of a lot of fighting, folks, a lot of bickering. Um, and I, as I say, you know, I think no matter which way the Senate goes, certainly the House and some of the conflicts that are going to come in the House are going to be pretty dramatic stuff over the next couple of years. And I think it's going to be a struggle for either Kevin McCarthy or anyone who becomes speaker, if he doesn't become speaker, to try to hold all that together. So I, I'm very curious about your thoughts, your questions, things that you've heard in the news that, uh, that you'd like to share. Um, as I said to my students this morning, we're all hearing things out there. We're all probably tapped into very different news sources. So I'm curious about what you may be hearing about all this or any questions that you might have about, about what I just presented. So I'll turn it over to all of you. Is there any, any thoughts from the floor that people would like to offer? Yeah, go right ahead. I, I don't have thoughts right now. About yeah, you, yeah. But back to the House of Representatives and the rule setting, does that happen every two years when the, the you know, House has elections? Yeah. Like yeah. Um, so that new rules can come into play? And, and who sets those rules? That's, that's good, two good questions. Let me repeat it for the audience. They, they asked me to repeat the questions for the folks on YouTube. The question was, first of all, um, when the rules change takes place, when does it take place? Um, and, and what was the second part of your question? Who sets the oh, who sets the rules? Yeah, sorry. Um, it's a majority decision in the House what the rules are. So the Republicans will determine the rules for the House if they're in the majority. They can make any rules they want like to. A, a the, 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 uh, the question is whether or not there's a committee that does that. Actually, it can come from any member. Of the, of the caucus. Any, anybody can advance a rule and then they vote on it. Um, so it could come from anyone. And I think, again, this group of about 40 members who are the Freedom Caucus folks, who are very much sort of the MAGA folks in the House, I think they're very likely to advance that right away as a group. Um, and again, demand that maybe as part of their support for Kevin McCarthy as speaker. So that's likely to happen. And it, it usually happens right at the beginning of a Congress, yes. That's usually in the first day or two of Congresses. That's when they usually make their rule decisions in both the House and Senate, by the way. So the Senate will go through the same, the same process. But, you know, again, it's going to be interesting to see if they actually do that. If they do, I think that's a very clear sign that they're planning to hold Kevin McCarthy's feet to the fire for the next two years. It's a very esoteric thing, and most people wouldn't even think of it. And it's probably going to be a a story that gets buried, you know, that day behind 20 other stories that are going on, but watch for it. Just keep that phrase in mind, motion to vacate the chair, because that's the phrase they use to refer to that, to that power. And if they, in fact, get that done, it's going to be a very different world for, for Kevin McCarthy. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. In the back. Um, you gave a, a long list of reasons why this midterm election was different from others. Uh, but the one thing you didn't mention is what a lot of conservative media are saying, which is this is a hangover from Trump because he went in with both feet into the election, uh, reminded people of all the mayhem he created and the election denialism. Uh, Republicans also some cases were making fun of the fact that Paul Pelosi was almost killed by somebody. Right, right. Um, and so it, it even appears that uh, Rupert Murdoch is starting to turn against Trump, right. blaming him for what's happening. Right. The, the question is, and I'm going to paraphrase it, Bill, but tell me if I've got it right. The question is, um, the one thing that I didn't mention about uh, the difference in this midterm election is the fact that Donald Trump threw himself into this election, backed a number of candidates, and um, many of those candidates, most of those candidates didn't do well. And so now there's some doubts that are creeping in. There's some criticism of Trump that's coming from conservative media. People are calling into question, people like Rupert Murdoch are calling into question whether or not Trump is maybe still the leader of the party. I, I think you're right about that. I, I, I'll say two things about it, though, and I, and, and I say this again with a certain amount of trepidation. But I think, number one, Trump has been in these moments before, and he's always survived them. Um, there are times when people have been equally critical of him as the leader of the Republican Party because he's got so much support in the party, and he's actually come through those periods. So whether or not that's still the case is an open question, I think. Um, right now, in the heat of the election, of course, a lot of that's circulating. Six months from now, whether that will still be the view I think maybe is another question. But the other, the other thing I will say, and, and I, again, this is by way of a bit of a prediction, but 
if Donald Trump does become a candidate in 2024, one of the things that I think um, we tend to forget is that when polls are taken and people are asked, would you support Donald Trump as a candidate in 2024? He does not always win those polls, um, and he's probably not going to win them following this election. I think there probably will be some backlash in that way. But the people who do support Donald Trump support him so strongly that they are the kind of people who are likely to turn out in primaries and vote in primaries. And I think what, what polls tend to miss, unless they ask this question, and some do, but what polls tend to miss is the intensity question, as we call it, right? Not just do you support Donald Trump, but how much do you support Donald Trump? And his supporters are incredibly intense in their support for him. They're not going to consider another candidate if Donald Trump is in the race. And those are the people who are motivated to turn out when primaries take place. So when we have, you know, rainy days on primary day and people are deciding, am I going to stop on my way home from work or not? The Trump people will stop. <laughs> They'll show up. And that tends to be the thing that wins primaries is that core group. Go ahead, Bill. You have a follow up. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a follow up. Yeah. So Right. So Trump even winning 30 percent of the vote might have been the top candidate for right. all the delegates. Right. And they did that in order to avoid um, having the contest go on for too long. They wanted to anoint somebody who could then start running for the general election. Right. Given what happened, is there any talk about them doing away with that? Good question. The, 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 the question is, the Republicans have a rule, had a rule in 2020, where um, primary elections were decided by a winner-take-all system. Whoever got the most votes got all of that state's delegates pledged to them. And the question is, would that, in fact, be the rule in 2024, so that if Trump did rise to the top of a poll, but not necessarily a large percentage, if he got enough votes to get the most votes in a primary, the plurality, as we call it, would that be enough to give him the nomination or push him towards the nomination again? If I got that pretty much right, Bill, is that what you, thanks. Um, it is true. I, 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 I will say this. I don't think all of the Republican primaries were winner take all. Many of them were. You're right about that. Um, and that certainly was a big help for Donald Trump um, in, in winning the nomination. Um, in, actually, in 2016, it was a big help for him because he was almost every Republican's second choice when their candidate dropped out. So he ended up picking up support, and that kind of snowballed into the nomination. Um, we don't know what the rules are going to be in 2024. I think it's a really good question. Um, whether the Republicans will stick to that is a good question. And if they anticipate, if enough Republicans who don't want Donald Trump as the nominee anticipate that might happen again, they may well change that rule. Um, it's up to them how they run their primaries, and, and really it's up to the states to determine that more even than the national party as to how they allocate their delegates in that way. So they may well decide to change that rule for that reason. Um, it's been the case for a while now that they've run most of their primaries that way. So I think it'd be kind of a hard sort of left turn for them to make that change. But everything's possible in politics these days, right? I, I, never, I never take anything off the table anymore about the realm of possibility. People could always rewrite the rules to have the outcome they want to see happen in, in nominations, and that's that's happened in the past as well. So it, sure, it, it's possible. I, I certainly think it is possible that that might happen. But again, you know, I think especially when it comes to these other candidates, the question really is, will people turn out for a Mike Pence the way they'll turn out for a Donald Trump? Um, I don't think they will. <laughs> and, and it'll be interesting to see if they do. If the feeling is strong enough that they don't want Donald Trump as the nominee, they may well get activated and do that. But it's going to be, I think, a, a heavy lift if, if Trump is in the race and people don't see an alternative that they are comfortable with. Um, it may well be that people will just sit it out rather than participate. And that in itself could end up giving Donald Trump the nomination in 2024. So a lot of dynamics here, a lot of possibilities here, I think, in the way this might unfold. Um, and certainly, as I say, the pattern in the past has been that they're likely to keep the same rules, but we'll have to see about that too. You know, it's, it's, it's a good question. It's an interesting, interesting question to ask. Any other questions that I can address? Yeah, I see a hand in the back and then to the front. Well, so I've been paying attention to a lot of things over the ballot list, and due to the lack left 
and due to the lack of lockstep performance of many Republicans in this uh, in this most recent election, uh, many are calling for a complete dismantling of Republican leadership, like and not just Kevin McCarthy. Are there right. any other uh, leadership positions that you think are going to be uh, put are going to be pawned uh, during the uh, you know during the uh, when Congress comes into session? Yeah, well? yeah, excellent question. Um, the question is given the results of the, the midterm elections and the unhappiness with the leadership of the Republican Party, are there other leaders in Congress in the Republican Party who are likely to be challenged in some way or, or denied leadership positions? Is that pretty much yeah. the question? Okay. Um, I do think that's possible. Um, I, I think in particular, when you're talking about, for example, who's going to be the majority leader with Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise seems to be the person that's most likely to get that job. But he could be challenged in that way. And, and again, that's considered a stepping stone to the speakership. So I would not be surprised at all, as you're suggesting, if rather than going after Kevin McCarthy, they went after Steve Scalise and decided to try to replace him with someone from, again, this Freedom Caucus group and have in the leadership position somebody from their group who would be leading their group in that way. Um, you know, the other possibility, of course, is that the Democrats if the Democrats do end up controlling the, the House of Representatives, I think again one of the one of the <laughs> one of the strangest stories this week perhaps has been Nancy Pelosi's talking about not running or at least not serving in the House anymore. I think she made the decision two years ago not to be Speaker if the Democrats held on to the House of Representatives. I think that's been in her plan for a long time. She dropped a lot of hints along the way after the last big leadership fight that she may well step down. I think the Democrats are going to go undergo a lot of changes in their leadership. I think actually that may be the party that sees the biggest changes after this midterm election. I think a lot of Democrats, again, especially progressive Democrats, not at all happy with Steny Hoyer as, the, as a possible minority leader for the Democrats. Um, Hoyer's getting older. He doesn't seem to represent their politics well. I think there's maybe going to be some rebellions on the Democratic side, too, that's going to change some of the leadership. So it's, it's again, an open question as to whether or not people are willing to mount those challenges. But if they are, I think there are going to be some big changes on both sides in that way. And uh, right now, there's a lot of unhappiness on both sides with their leadership. Uh, Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, that's a different story. They're a little harder to dislodge. But again, I, I wouldn't say it's out of the realm of possibility particularly in, in Mitch McConnell's case, if they end up the majority in the Senate, I wouldn't say it's out of the realm of possibility for a challenge to him in that way. Um, again, I, that's where Rick Scott's coming from, I think. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see if people are willing to stick their necks out in that way. Um, yeah, the, again, I think back to John Boehner. When they tried this with John Boehner and they lost, these people were put into exile by Boehner. They were, they were given terrible committee assignments. Their names, I can still remember them because they're Daniel Webster, believe it or not, and Ted Nugent. I kid you not, those are the names of the two people. Not the musician and not Daniel Webster, of course, the senator from Massachusetts, but they both ended up losing their major committee assignments. They were put on some committees where they really couldn't do much, and they were punished for trying to take on the speaker. So we'll see, you know, if people are willing to, to take that risk, not only on the Republican side, but again, on the Democratic side, too. It's a good question. Yeah. I think we maybe have time for one more, and then we're getting close to 8 o'clock. So, oh, you had your hand up. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go right ahead. Yeah. Oh, uh, regarding the, Repu uh, the, uh, the deniers. Yes. Uh, have you heard anything about, like, the secretaries of state who were up for re-election or, or election um, and, uh, uh, from the denier pool? Yeah, yeah. From what I understand, and again, I have Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. <laughs> the question is, um, when it comes to the folks who have been election deniers, um, whether or not the Secretary of State's candidates, who were the people, of course, who run the election in the different states, um, whether or not they were successful this time around. Um, I haven't seen numbers on that yet, and I apologize. I, I wanted to look at those, and I just haven't had time. But I will say, I did see two news stories that essentially said that um, some won, but not many um, in that category. There were some states where they were successful, but many of the states, I think the majority of the states where they ran, they were not successful at winning. So I, I think, again, it might still be a, 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 an issue, I think, in some of these states. Um, but I don't have numbers, and I, I'm sorry, I wish I did, yeah. Um, I will say this, in the, in the House of Representatives, 219 of the candidates running in the House of Representatives for re-election were all people who denied 
that Joe Biden won the 2020 election, and the vast majority of them were reelected. So that issue is still going to be floating around in the House. And again, another kind of pressure on Kevin McCarthy as to how he handles that when it comes to uh, dealing with the politics of his, of his caucus. I think it's going to be a rough issue for him as well around that. So yeah, great question. Thank you, everybody, so much. I really appreciate you coming tonight. And I thank everybody who joined us online as well. So thank you. That was a wonderful presentation, as always, Dr. Smales. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, expert knowledge and analysis. And thank everyone here and at home for attending. I'll just remind people uh, here, if they'd like to fill out the evaluation form, we'd appreciate that. And have a great evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone. Yes, I have. Yes.